Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. What do you do when you look at the person you've promised to spend the rest of your life with and realize you don't really talk with each other anymore? Several years into her marriage, writer Molly Pascal had to confront that question. Kristen Scott Thomas, who stars in the new movie Darkest Hour, reads her essay, How the Dining Dead Got Talking Again. As two people, newly in love, we talked and talked. We were in our early 30s then, so our talk included a history and a reckoning of all our previous loves, how they endured and how they ended. We talked about our past loves to see how they stacked up against the present one. Were any of them as big as this? No. How could they be? Falling in love for us meant falling into talk. We talked about our memories, our broken bones, broken hearts, and one broken marriage. We talked about our mothers, one Jewish and one Italian, constantly cooking and feeding. We talked about our fathers, neither of whom cooked or fed. We talked about our friends, come and gone. We talked about our careers, climbing the ladder of success, falling off the ladder, leaning in and leaning out. We talked about our dreams of travelling, of marriage, of how many children we would like and what we would name them. With those subjects addressed, we turned to smaller details and anecdotes. The stories about getting drunk, getting lost, crashing the car, stealing a candy bar and falling down a flight of subway stairs before a job interview. Finally, we talked about the non-stories, the quirky facts and facets of personality. Our favourite movies, what we like to eat, what we wouldn't eat. He hated Kalamata olives. He could do without cucumbers. I hated capers and marshmallows and the end of Ghostbusters. He talked about rivers and rocks. I quoted Frank O'Hara and Mayakovsky. We compared 5K running times. There was never enough time and so much to discuss. We talked about the colours of leaves, the shapes of clouds and why the word warmth has a hidden P. We talked about sex, we talked about our wedding we talked about our new house we talked about furnishing it, we talked about pregnancy, we talked about the child then the second Seven years into it our marriage was different After the machinations of getting the children to sleep we would sit side by side in bed with computers on our laps, surfing the internet. We were not talking, not sleeping, so close and yet so far apart. This dynamic of being physically together but emotionally disengaged had also bled into the mundane of the everyday, with too much silence and space between us on the couch and with us cooking on opposite sides of the kitchen island. We still talked, of course, but it was a different kind of talk. We spoke about the children, what they wanted for lunch, who would pick them up from school, and how to negotiate the dinner invitations for the weekend. We spoke of bills and laundry loads. We spoke about the organisational details of our day-to-day. These necessary conversations were the wheels on which our days turned. We didn't talk about sex much anymore, other than figuring out how to have it with children barging through our door and demanding to know what we were doing. Instead, we read body language. Was one of us asleep before the other? Were we touching, not touching, belly down? I might turn my back, my body curved away from my husband in a posture of rejection. He might lightly touch my back and feel my body tighten, Sign language for no sex tonight. We were so tired. One night we went to dinner, 
just the two of us. And as we sat there, quietly eating, a horrible memory came to mind. It wasn't a memory of my own experience. It was a memory of my watching a scene in a movie. In Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Kate Winslet, who plays Clementine, and Jim Carrey, who plays her boyfriend, Joel, are eating silently in a restaurant when Joel notices that all of the couples around them aren't talking. Are we like those bored couples you feel sorry for in restaurants? Joel muses to himself. Are we the dining dead? My husband and I sat there stone-faced, like two more of the dining dead. We need to talk, my husband said. I waited for the bomb to drop. No, he said, I mean just talk. I thought of some of the elderly couples I knew. I thought of how they talked, if they did. It wasn't an especially auspicious picture. They talked mostly about how hard it was to be old. Dyed hair, plastic surgery, jazzercise. The weather, too hot, too cold, too much rain. And the daily health reports. An ache here, an ache there, insomnia, joints, vision, bowels. Quite a lot of bowels. I could see my husband and me, 25 years from now, silently ingesting our dinner in some cafeteria, then returning to sleep in our downsized condo, all without being able to come up with anything of consequence to say to each other. We decided to give talking a real go. That night, we sat purposefully on the couch. We put away the computers. We silenced our ringers. We looked at each other and smiled. What do you want to talk about? I asked. What do you want to talk about? He asked. We stared at each other. Did you hear what Otis said? My husband asked. I told him to turn off the faucet when he was brushing his teeth so he wouldn't waste water, and he got really angry and told me that I had once wasted french fries. We laughed. And the other day I began, I stopped. I think we need to make a rule, I said. We can't talk about the children because we could talk about them all day. Okay. We tried again. We stared at each other some more. I admired how handsome and muscular my husband still looked. Well, that was good, wasn't it? Who needed to talk? Well, this wasn't going well. We needed a different approach. We shipped the children to the in-laws. Then we locked our phones in the glove compartment and drove a few hours south into West Virginia, returning to the kind of place where we had first really talked, on a mountain in the woods. I was afraid. What if we had nothing left to talk about? I remember the first few hours for the paucity of conversation. We hiked and breathed. We stopped to drink water. We listened to the racket of our bodies moving through the world, tripping, breathing, sneezing, and the sounds of nature to which I was suddenly attuned. The jackhammer of a woodpecker, the predatory screech of a hawk, the frozen stare of an exposed turtle, and the soft sway of brush around a snake. During that time, even my internal monologue was silent. It turned out that with all the time in the world to think, some of it must be spent not thinking. We felt refreshed and relieved to be absorbed in the rhythm of our steps. We stopped for lunch. We chatted about nothing, then a little something, and as we walked, we forgot about trying to talk and ended up talking. We were freed from the mechanics of life, so our talk could be too. I'd forgotten that there are certain places that promote conversation. With my children, for example, I'd noticed that if I asked them over dinner what had happened at school, they would always reply, nothing. But in the car the next morning, they would often transform into chatterboxes. Likewise, while hiking, we relaxed and fell back into talking. We related stories that we'd forgotten to tell each other, funny exchanges from work. We bantered and flirted, sidestepping into tangents. We reminisced, too, about our early days. An entirely new kind of talking that comes from having known someone for a long time. 
Now, several times a year, my husband and I leave the children for a weekend and go hiking. We have talked our way across the ridge of North Fork Mountain of West Virginia, down 18 miles of the Narrows in Zion National Park, through the wilds of Dolly Sods, and across the mountains of Vermont and New Hampshire. Couples spend so much time together throughout a life. We human beings live a lot longer than we used to. Some of us stay married to the same person for 50 or 60 years. It's no wonder we run out of things to talk about. It's no surprise that we join the ranks of the dining dead. But it doesn't have to be that way. During our weekend respites, my husband and I feel inspired by a new alliance, a new adventure. We feel the power of long-term coexistence and a sense of having gone through the rage of life and emerged. That's how we fell into talk again. That's how we fell in love again. That's Kristen Scott Thomas reading Molly Pascal's essay, How the Dining Dead Got Talking Again. Well, how are Molly and her husband doing now? More after the break. We're back. It's Modern Love, the podcast. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. Molly Pascal says that connecting through conversation has been central to her relationship with her husband from the first time they met. We have a mutual friend who invited a group of us to hike in Shenandoah National Park. There's a certain mountain there called Old Rag Mountain, and you can hike it in the winter by the light of the full moon without any headlamps. We actually met at a rest stop McDonald's outside of the bathrooms, And then we drove down to the beginning of that hike, and we spent six hours hiking that mountain, just talking the entire time. Molly and her husband have been married for almost 10 years, and she says that in her piece, she wanted to explore a facet of marriage that isn't often talked about. Falling in love is such a small piece of the story. It's maybe one month, two months, six months, or a year of the love story. And then after that, there's so much more to tell, not about how you fall in love, but about how love is sustained. But fully sustaining that love after the birth of her two children proved to be a challenge. When I became a mother, I was consumed by becoming a mother. I, I really did lose my sense of self. We had two kids 17 months apart and didn't sleep for three or four years. Life just became much more about how to get through each day more than the two of us connecting. And that focus lasted for quite some time, where at a certain point we had to look at each other and say, okay, we need to put the kids aside and be present for each other. You have a family, but the foundation of that family for us is the love, our love for each other. But it really took pushing the children away a little bit from time to time and just spending time alone, the two of us, being present with each other. Molly says she heard from a lot of people after her piece came out, including family members. After my mother-in-law read this piece, she said to me, I just want you to know that we've been married 50 years and 43 of those were good years. I think she was trying to tell me that this is par for the course, that relationships aren't easy, and it helps other couples to know that we sort of all go through the same things and can come out the other side. Molly Pascal. She's a writer living in Pittsburgh with her husband and two children. After the break, Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for The New York Times. Dan Jones says that the first phase of falling in love is about curiosity and wanting to know everything about another person. But eventually, that phase comes to an end. 
what used to be sort of fresh and familiar now feels like annoying and dull. <laughs> and those are just, you know, it's, it's just the evolution of, of love and of marriage, of marriage with kids and getting sort of ground down by routine. You know, I really admire the turn this essay takes where they just make a conscious effort to put away the phones and think like, well, where are the places where we do talk and where are the places where we can be curious about each other again and talk excitedly about things in the way that we used to, to rediscover that and find that sense of companionship and excitement again uh, is just so essential to keeping a relationship alive over the long term. Next week, Greta Gerwig, director of Lady Bird, reads the story of a woman who receives a surprising proposition while sharing a New York City cab ride with her coworker. I thought of all the times in my life I had said no, all the roads I had never hitched, all the chances I had never taken, all the lips I had never kissed. And I thought, New York is not about no. New York is about yes. Now you can find us on Spotify. Just search Modern Love and find us under podcasts and videos. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, John Parati, Amory Sievertson, and Caitlin O'Keefe. Additional sound design by Paul Vikas. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. See you next week.